Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Not Just Paleo. I'm your host, Evan Brand, and I want to send you back to the website. I did a minor redesign at notjustpaleo.com, but surprisingly, a lot of people out there, maybe yourself, are wanting to start a blog, whether it's on paleo or health or whatever it is. You could make one about cookies if you if you wanted to. If you go to the top of the website at notjustpaleo.com and you see resources up in the menu bar, You just look there and you'll see how to start a blog and I teach you step by step exactly how I started Not Just Paleo and how you can do the same. So that's all I got before the show and let's get right into it. Hello there, I'm back here with Katie Amato who is from a town outside of Chicago and I can't remember, I told her I can't remember how I found her but she has a lot of really incredible experience that we're going to get to talk about through her schooling and her profession, working at the University of Colorado in Boulder, which she is currently investigating gut microbiota of primates. It's kind of a mouthful to to explain exactly what what she does, but uh, we'll get into that today. So Katie, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I just saw that you did a TEDx talk, and I watched that to hear about your experience in the jungle but maybe it'd be cool to get people up to speed on who you are and what you do yeah absolutely um so i am currently a postdoc at the university of colorado boulder i did my phd at the university of illinois um and when i was doing my phd uh, i got really interested in um gut microbes when i was first starting out um i had always been interested in primates and primate behavior um but spending time kind of out in the field watching primate primates it, i realized that the kinds of questions I wanted to ask about their nutrition and their ecology, um, I really couldn't ask just by by watching them. I, I had to have other sorts of data to analyze. Um, and I started reading about the gut microbiota um, and what we were just starting to learn about in humans. And that got me thinking about what might be going on in wild environments where natural selection is at play. Um, so, for example, uh, there was a study that came out several years ago now that was looking at obesity in humans and it suggested that gut microbes might play a role in obesity um, in the sense that if a person had certain types of gut microbes that were more efficient at producing energy from one's food um, and then that energy was absorbed uh, by that organism that if it wasn't used that would lead to obesity right so you're basically getting more energy than you need and not using it Um, And that made me start thinking about what would happen if you were an organism that did need that, that did want that extra energy. And that would be perhaps um, a wild animal uh, during seasons where there's less food availability or during seasons when you're reproducing and need more energy and nutrients. Um, So I decided to go start looking at those sorts of relationships in wild primates. That is neat. So the idea that you kind of alluded to is that maybe through human evolution, certain people or maybe certain branches of our species have a certain gut microbiome that you're saying it would have helped us at one point to be able to provide extra energy with less food. But now it's those people that still maybe have that gut biome. They're kind of they're kind of disadvantaged. Yeah, so I think that absolutely could have happened over human evolution um, that, you know, perhaps humans in general uh, compared to other primates and animals have gut microbes that can provide us with more energy and would allow us to uh, create these big brains that we have that no other animal has. Um, But it also happens on a shorter time scale um, just based on the kinds of things that we eat, right? So um, what I'm eating in the United States uh, is very different than what somebody in a hunter-gatherer tribe in Africa might be eating. Um, And we have seen that the kind of energy production can differ. And, you know, maybe if you're a hunter-gatherer, you need extra energy production. Um, But maybe if I'm, you know, sitting around at my house on the couch eating hamburgers, I don't necessarily need extra energy. I'm probably getting enough out of my diet um, kind of without the microbes' help. 
Um, Because what the microbes do, I should back up a little bit, is um, most of our microbes in our gut are found in the large intestine. Um, And basically when you eat food, you digest most of it before it gets to the large intestine um, using your own body's enzymes and, and physical processes. So what gets to the large intestine is really everything that you can't digest by yourself. And that's where the gut microbes come in, and they can help break some of those compounds down. So these are things like fiber. Um, And then they provide us with energy and sometimes nutrients or vitamins that we wouldn't be getting out of that food anyway. Um, And so depending on the kind of microbe you can – you. Depending on the kinds of microbes that you have, you can be producing more or less energy or more or less vitamins. Um, and so that is linked to diet, and that's where you start to see those those variations. That's interesting. So myself, I mean, I noticed when I started eating bison, I mean, I, I had always eaten, well, as of, as of the last few years, I was eating grass-fed beef, and then I made the switch or the addition of bison to my diet and i swear my energy was quadrupled i don't know what you might think about that but i definitely noticed it yeah so that you know it's hard to know without actually measuring it right but um that could have something to do with the you know nutritional composition of the bison itself um but that also probably did change the types of gut microbes that you had um you know different foods are going to get broken down differently and um different things are going to arrive into the large intestine as a result and that can absolutely affect what kinds of microbes are there and then that in turn affects you know what they're doing and and what kind of things they're providing you with makes sense yeah so in your in your ted talk you were talking about how you went to the rainforest and i want to talk about that because it sounds awesome but how basically the way you like to talk about the gut microbiome is the same thing is that we have this sort of warm moist environment that's basically an internal rainforest that we really need to start taking better care of and i've been working on my gut health for probably five years and i'm still working on it but that i mean that's a huge focal point that you think we need to really shift our lenses to yeah absolutely so our guts are like a rainforest in the sense that yeah in terms of kind of the climate if you will is probably in really general terms similar um But more than that, the diversity of the community, Um, you know, there's thousands of different kinds of microbes in your gut, just as there's thousands of different kinds of organisms in a rainforest. And as a result, um, the ecology of that community is really, really complex. You know, think about trying to describe everything that's going on in a rainforest. Even if you're looking at a small patch of rainforest, it's going to take a lot of work and be really difficult. Um, And the same thing goes for our, our gut microbes and our gut microbial community. Um, there's a ton that we're, we're starting to uncover and starting to see patterns, uh, but it's going to take us a while to really start to understand all the mechanisms and all the relationships and, and, uh, connections that there are in that community. Right. Yeah. I want to ask about your experience in the rainforest here in a second, but I'm curious to know what is, what you think is the most important aspect of gut health? Because even if you're eating a lot of good foods, if your variety is minimal, then I'm guessing that your gut your uh, your gut microbe uh, variability is going to be pretty small. I mean, it's only going to adapt to what you're eating. So it's almost like variety is is the spice of life for the gut too. That you got to have, even if you're eating organic spinach, for example, you want to make sure you're eating other vegetables and other greens and things like that too to kind of balance it out. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I would say to some extent, based on what I've seen, yes. Um, I don't know that we have a study that directly looks at that, at least in humans yet. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, what I have seen preliminarily with um, the wild primates is that, indeed, if you sample a, uh, a primate in a continuous evergreen rainforest, so one that has been minimally disturbed by humans, um, their diets tend to be more diverse um, in those habitats than howler monkeys that are living in fragmented forests, so forests that have been disturbed. Um, That's kind of a a general trend. There's obviously exceptions. Um, But if you look at the gut microbes of those two different populations of primates, um, and they're the same species, you'll actually see... uh, less diversity in the gut microbes um, of the primates in the 
fragmented forest versus the continuous forest. Um, and this was in howler monkeys specifically, I saw this. So as their dietary diversity was reduced, it seemed that their gut microbial diversity was also reduced. Um, so I think dietary diversity is a key. Um, and we're still trying to kind of unravel all of these relationships in humans, you know, is there a superfood that you can eat? Well, we don't really know that yet. Um, but it does seem like you say that you should be eating a diverse diet with a lot of fruits and vegetables and, and fiber in it. Right. So where specifically were you at, uh, observing these howler monkeys? Um, so most of the field work that I've done, uh, was in Palenque National Park in the state of Chiapas in southeastern Mexico. Um, it's about two to three hours from the border with Guatemala. Okay. How do you spell that? I want to look that up. Um, Palenque is P-A-L-E-N-Q-U-E. Okay, that's awesome. And it's actually better known for being a, a Mayan archaeological site. So there's ruins uh, from, from the Maya civilization there. So, so the important question is, did you get free time to go check out the Mayan ruins? Uh, a little bit. I had myself on a pretty tight <laughs> schedule while I was down there. But um, what's really cool actually about that forest is that um, it's partially protected because of the archaeological site. So the forest is actually growing on top of the ruins. Um, and so they've excavated part of that, which is kind of the religious center of the city with all the big pyramids and kind of um, stereotypical, you know, magnificent buildings that you might think of. Um, the rest of the city is still unexcavated, and that's what the forest is still growing on top of. Um, so I took a day here and there to go look at the excavated part of the ruins, um, but I spent every day really on top of the ruins um, when I was following the monkeys around, which was kind of cool. That's incredible. So you're saying basically that there's still a lot of ruins that are built in and hidden into the forest? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the map that I used to get around the forest was actually a map made by archaeologists that had done like a scan of everything that was still buried. And so I would figure out where I was in the forest based on Mayan buildings, basically, that looked like hills um, under some of the trees. Oh, my gosh. That's like Indiana Jones style. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it was. it's a really, really beautiful, fascinating place. <laughs> so tell us about some of your experiences, maybe some of your, your fun ones and your, and your scientific experiences that, you've, that you had down there. Well, <laughs> there certainly is a lot. So in, in, in terms of the science, kind of um, my typical day was uh, you wake up before the sun comes up um, and you, you, I would need to be in the forest uh, basically as the sun was coming up. All primates tend to kind of, um, you know, live their lives with the cycle of the sun, right? So as the sun is coming up, they're waking up. And as it starts to go down, they're going to sleep. Um, so if you want to find them before they go somewhere else, um, especially if you, you were with them the day before and knew where they went to sleep, uh, you got to get there before they wake up. Um, howler monkeys also are called howler monkeys because they howl. Um, it's one of the loudest animal sounds there is on the earth, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and they tend to do that when the sun comes up and when it goes down as well. So even if you weren't following them the day before and know where they are, it's still good to get out there early because you're more likely to hear them and be able to find them. Um, and then basically I would follow them around all day, every day, um, the groups, and I would uh, observe individual monkeys um, about 20 minutes at a time, recording their behavior um, at, a, at a set period of time during those 20 minutes um, so that I could get an idea of, um, or a quantitative measure really, of what they were eating, how active they were, um, those kinds of data. Uh, and then I would collect fecal samples for them from them whenever they gave me the opportunity, uh, which is not glamorous. <laughs> yeah. It's part of the job, though. It's important. I saw the pictures that it, their poop was so green on on the pictures that you had on the presentation. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it kind of, again, like a lot of us, kind of varies on depending on what they ate, you know. Um, but, yeah, it uh, can be pretty green. Um and that's they're arboreal. They they rarely come to the ground, so they're usually you know thirty forty meters up in the trees. Um, so these samples are are falling. They're not being put nicely on the ground. <laughs> um, so there's always a little bit of scrambling involved because um, we would be collecting um, from specific individuals over time. So I wanted to know 
which sample belonged to which individual. So that took a lot of binocular work and kind of scrambling quickly uh, to to find samples before another sample fell near it or before we forgot where it had fallen. Um, and that was kind of it in terms of the the field work. Um, you know, long days, but also it's great to spend time in the rainforest. Um, howler monkeys sleep about 70% of the day, depending. Um, so there's a lot of downtime, which isn't always super exciting uh, as an investigator, because that means you're, you're sitting around watching sleeping monkeys. Um, <laughs> But that also means that you're sitting in a rainforest for a few hours every day and you're seeing things that the normal person wouldn't necessarily see. Um, so I got to see things um, like hummingbird nests um, I, that I would stumble upon or, um, you know, there were a lot of fair de lance snakes in the rainforest, um, but we also came across some um, boa constrictors and one or two other snakes that I only saw once in the whole year that I was there. Um, all, all sorts of diversity that you, you see while you're sitting in the rainforest there. Um, so That's amazing. Yeah, I haven't got to fill you in on my past too much, but I used to work in Kentucky at a park and... It was 4,000 acres, so not quite as cool as a rainforest, but a lot of my time and a lot of my spiritual connectedness and groundedness to, to life itself was spent in the woods and developed from time in the woods. And I was curious to know, you know what it's like from you for you to go working in the university setting and then actually getting out of the getting off the desk and getting immersed into that and just what that did to your, I don't know, I guess maybe your overall consciousness or maybe just your I don't know. I just feel like it would be such an enlightening experience to be immersed into that world. Yeah, it absolutely is. It, it makes you feel small, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, it's like staring at the ocean. Um, you're in this, this giant forest with all this life, and, um, you know, you're a very small, temporary part of that. Um, you know, it, it also gives you appreciation for the, the people that actually live there every day. So I'm a scientist going in, and I have a certain understanding of that rainforest and that ecosystem and those those primates. Um, but I, I didn't grow up there. I don't live there. And um, there was a lot of interesting things to be learned from the people that had ranches there um, or that lived nearby the forest. You know, there's things that they know, be it you know, kind of the, the old wives' tales type of knowledge or, or actual hands-on knowledge from, like, the park guards who were patrolling every single day. Um, so that was also um, a really interesting perspective to get, right? So it kind of takes you out of the scientific side of it to some extent and really shows you that um, there's more to this place than even you are seeing who are there every day studying it for, you know, um, I live there for a year continuously, but probably over the past five to 10 years, I've spent about three years there. Um, so it's a, it's a really, really interesting experience. And then in the scientific side of it, um, I also think it's really important to get up from your desk and go out and, and see the places where these samples are coming from. A lot of people that study um, microbes, get the samples sent to them and they do the lab analysis and then the, the data analysis on the computer, which is great. And those people have some really important skills. Um, but I always caution, you know, if you weren't standing there in the place, there may be something in the data or something about a certain sample that that is odd or different. Um, and you're not going to have any idea why, um, just because you don't have kind of that, the feel for that place, um, that the person that, was there collecting the samples does necessarily. Um, you know, if I get a point way off to the side on a graph, I can say, oh, that was the, the one that was sick um, for two months. That makes sense. Um, but that's not something that necessarily somebody would just know. Uh, right. So Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So the place you were at, you would consider that a fragmented forest. I guess there's a lot of I mean, is it modern de modern developments? Like you mentioned ranches and stuff like that. Is a lot of the forest there just pieced apart and these monkeys are just trying to scramble to stay away from humans? Or 
Um, a lot of the landscape there is like that. Um, where I did most of, the, of my data collection, however, was um, it's considered a continuous forest. Um, it's protected. It's about 800 hectares. Um, so it's not huge. It's not like the Amazon. Um, but it is a pretty large chunk of forest. Um, it's hard to say that any rainforest in the entire world is untouched now because right. that's not true. Um, so yeah, I spent most of my time in the continuous forest, but then the area around uh, the park and some of the area within the park, um, due to kind of the transition, um, you know, from having it be unprotected to protected, um, there are like pasture lands there. Um, and, and you tend to get little patches of forest where there's streams or, um, you know, randomly where somebody just hasn't gotten there yet to, to develop whatever they were going to develop. Um, so a lot of kind of rural pasture land. Um, and then outside the park borders, you also have um, pastures like that, but there's also um, hotels and, and that was starting to develop even more while I was there. Um, so slightly more modern, but Palenque in general is not a, a large city by any means. Um, so it definitely has a rural feel. Yeah. Um, so you said 800 hectares? Yes. Okay, so I did a little conversion. So that's a little under 2,000 acres. Okay. So mm -hmm. that, that gives me a, an idea of how big that is. That's still pretty big. I mean, when I was at the park of 4,000 acres, it wasn't, it wasn't definitely in a square. It was really, really long. It was really narrow, only maybe 150 feet at some part. So it was super long. But to, to think of half of that, that's, a lot of, that's still a lot of space. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a pretty big park. Um, you know, as you move closer to Guatemala, there's more forest in Mexico and Guatemala that, um, is even larger and can support some of that, the larger fauna that you can't find in Palenque anymore. Um, for example, Palenque used to have spider monkeys. It doesn't anymore. Um, it probably can't support jaguar populations, um, but there are smaller cats there. Um, so yeah, large forest, but it's definitely not untouched. Yeah, that's what, that was my next question, is if you saw any jaguars, because I know they're close to around there. Yeah, they, they definitely exist in Mexico. Um, and while I was there, uh, it was somebody, I was going to say it was reported, but it was like a local person told somebody who told somebody who told me um, uh, that a jaguar had been seen uh, near where I would stay. Um, but kind of the general consensus was that that jaguar probably didn't live there. It was probably passing through from kind of one area to another. Um, but there were ocelots there. I, the park guards told me that they um, had found some ocelots with, that were actually living in the park. So definitely some smaller cats. That's neat. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see when I look up ocelots on Wikipedia, it shows that, you know, they have the conservation status for all the animals. It's It's under least concern, so... They seem to be doing okay, probably just because they're so much smaller than a than a jaguar. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with space. And the same thing it can be said of um, howler monkeys versus spider monkeys. So howler monkeys are unique in the sense that um, they can change their diet very extremely. So when there's fruit around, they will eat fruit. They, they will prefer it, if you will. Um, but during seasons where there's not a lot of fruit, um, they'll just switch their diet over to more leaves, and their diet can go from you know, 60, 70, 80% fruit to 60, 70, 80% leaves, um, which is a huge change. Uh, spider monkeys, on the other hand, um, are pretty uh, strict fruit eaters. They do eat some leaves in their diet and, and flowers and things like that, but most of their diet is fruit, and that does not change seasonally. So when it becomes harder to find fruit, they have to travel farther to find it, to find those trees that have it. Um, and so they uh, disappear more quickly when a forest is fragmented, that's amazing. So you're saying mostly harder to find, meaning just that the fruit trees were cut down most of the time? Uh, yeah, so fruit trees tend to get cut down in these forest fragments. When, when you fragment a forest, it usually changes the kind of microclimate of the area. Also, you don't get as many of these big fruiting trees as you would in a larger forest that's kind of climatically more protected. Um, and then also just in terms of space, even if the forest was exactly the same but smaller, spider monkeys wouldn't necessarily have enough um, room to be able to go find uh, a tree that's fruiting. Um, so these trees don't necessarily all fruit at the same time every year. So sometimes there may be a lot of trees fruiting within like an acre, let's say. Um, but sometimes there might be none in that acre and those spider monkeys would have to travel, 
you know, five acres to go find a tree with fruit in it. Um, but if that forest was cut down and they only have one acre, uh, they're kind of stuck without food, basically. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I guess we can get back into the science in a minute, but I wanted to ask about what it was like for you. I'm sure you were eating some really fresh food in your time down there compared to what you would get here in the States. That's probably shifted your consciousness when you're, well, you're in Boulder, so you're in a pretty healthy city, but (laughs) I'm sure it shifted your consciousness about food in general. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So really for convenience sake, um, I I became a vegetarian while I was down there. Um, We would go buy food about once a week in in the market, which was, you know, a a solid probably four miles away. So we'd take a little, you know, uh, it's like a bus, but it's a 15 passenger van that goes by every so often um, to go buy food. So you're only doing that once a week. And um, I just was a hassle to to buy meat. Um, So basically went vegetarian and was making things that were simple and, and fast to, to cook because basically you get back in the afternoon, it's 5, 6 p.m., um, you have to do some data entry on the computer, and then, you know, it's 8, 9, you have to get up at 5 the next morning, and there's no internet, so you end up going to bed pretty early. So um, we were very into things that were quick and easy to make. Um, so, yeah, it was a very simple, kind of fresh, vegetable, fruit-based diet, Um and yeah, it, it was great. I mean, in general, I felt pretty good while I was down there, whether that was from just being in the rainforest environment, um, because you're kind of out there in nature and it, you know, makes you feel more connected, like you were saying, or diet or all of those things. Um, absolutely. It was, um, is, I would say generally a very positive experience. It sounds like it. Yeah. I'll send you Hopefully, yeah, I can. I'll actually bookmark it right now, so I send it to you. So I've been curious about this, the whole science behind why an, a forest, whether it's a rainforest or whatever, would make you feel so good. And apparently, this is getting huge in Japan. It's just called Shinrin Yoku, and it just means taking in the atmosphere of the forest. And so I'm working on this book on stress, trying to explain without just being like, oh, I love the forest, man. You know, I'm trying right. to actually have something to back it up. And so there's tons of studies popping up now talking about the reduction that's been measured in humans of salivary cortisol after spending even something as minimal as 15 minutes in the forest. I mean, blood pressure's dropping, pulse rate's dropping, heart rate variability's going up, cortisol's going down. I mean, it's amazing stuff. And I'm just glad that you've had the experience to to feel that, and then you go back to the city and you can feel the difference or the the disconnectedness from that and what it really does to your health. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd love to look, take a look. Okay, I'll send it to you. Yeah, so let's talk about how we can apply what your research is is showing and and what you're doing with research. How does this tie back into humans? What what is this teaching you, and what can you teach us about? what we need to be doing. Yeah. So, um, kind of what I found from the howler monkeys, um, was that, you know, when they're going through these extreme diet changes, their gut microbes are also changing. So when their diet shifts, the gut microbes shift, um, which makes sense based on what I was talking about with, with diet and kind of what ends up in your large intestine. Um, but even more interestingly, when the howler monkeys were consuming less energy, um, it appeared that the howler, mon- the howler monkey gut microbes uh, were producing more energy. So I could measure what's called a volatile fatty acid in the fecal material. Um, and volatile fatty acids are produced by microbes when they break down fiber and other compounds. Um, and we can absorb them in our large intestine and use them for energy. Um, and so generally what you measure in the fecal material tends to be considered proportional to what's probably produced. Um, and so I was seeing more of these volatile fatty acids during periods when the howler monkeys were consuming less energy in their diet. So it looks like these gut microbes were kind of compensating uh, for these these variations in the diet from season to season. Um, it also appears, based on the data, that females and juveniles have slightly different microbes than males. Um, and this could be linked to their nutritional needs with reproduction and growth. Um, so they tended to have um, more bacteria from the Firmicutes phylum, uh, which is thought to, they're thought to be those efficient energy producers. Um, and females also tended to have more of the microbes uh, 
that are linked with folic acid production. And folic acid is really important um, for re reproducing females um, in all primates, including humans. Um, so it looks like these microbes could be giving the primates this kind of nutritional boost, if you will, to help them survive a variable environment and help them survive periods when their nutritional demands are higher. And presumably that's what our microbes were doing for us over time as well, kind of helping us out um, in terms of um, you know, stepping in when our diet was maybe lower in energy or certain nutrients, um, stepping in when we needed more for reproduction or growth. Um, you know, presumably that's what gut microbes do for their hosts kind of in general, and that's why these relationships evolved in most animals. Um, and so that's a piece that in a lot of the human gut microbe research right now I think is missing. Um, we kind of assume it, um, but no, not a lot of people are measuring it out in the wild, looking at wild animals and looking at these relationships. And I think that's a really important part of the relationship to understand, especially for us as we're looking um, at these things in ourselves, because presumably that's, like I said, how this relationship started. It's not necessarily how it is now, I would argue, um, but it's probably still influencing how we interact with our microbes and influencing our health. Yeah, well, something that's ridiculous is the amount of fertility clinics that are out there now because we've destroyed our gut so much, which maybe this is kind of what you're suggesting. Our relationship with our gut is so horrible now, and we treat our gut like crap with stress and food toxins and just poor quality food in general as a society that we have places like fertility clinics you have to go to just to try to have a baby because we're so damaged internally that we cannot successfully do that. Yeah, so the the field of human gut microbiome research is is relatively new still, I would say. You know, we've learned a lot in the past decade or so, um, but but there's still a lot to learn and we're really just starting to see kind of the beginnings of patterns. But based on those beginnings of patterns, it looks like our gut microbes they're obviously influencing our nutrition. I've talked about that already. They're influencing our immune system. Um, so uh, there's been studies that show that um, mice, if you keep them sterile um, after they're born, so we're all actually born relatively sterile in terms of microbes, and especially gut microbes, and you start to pick them up from your surroundings, especially your mother, um, while you're being born and after you're born. Um, and there's ways that you can keep mice um, from picking up those microbes when they're born and after they're born. Um, and those mice actually have reduced immune function compared to mice with a normal gut microbial community. Um, and so there's some really strong data suggesting that our gut microbes contribute to the development of our immune system and a failure of gut microbial communities to develop may lead to immune failures um, in terms of general immune function, in terms of autoimmune disease, in terms of allergies. Um, and there's also research um, that's starting to look at the links between gut microbes and our behavior in our brains. Um, so there's been links between gut microbes and anxiety and depression and aggression. Um, and again, we don't really understand all the mechanisms there, uh, but there are patterns and there are links that are there. Um, what we do think is happening at least part of the time is that these microbes, when they're breaking things down in our gut, are producing compounds, some of which we can use and some of which we don't necessarily use, um, but that can get into our bloodstream and, and affect us in other ways outside of the gut. Um, so really, there's a lot of ways that these gut microbes can be affecting our health, our behavior, our nutrition. And we're really only just starting to understand that. I don't even want to use the word understand, but, but starting to realize that those connections are there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've actually gone a little bit into that about how your mood can be affected. And I mean, so right now, if I were helping somebody with anxiety or stress, I'd probably start with, you know, spending more time in nature and fixing your blood sugar and things like that. And then eventually I would probably move on to something like chamomile tea or passion flower or something like that. But I found a couple things that you're referring to and... A specific uh, probiotic. It was the lactobacillus. It's I think I think you pronounce yeah. it rhamnosis, mm -hmm. rhamnosis JB one. That was one that it was found that by taking that you can have fewer stress, few, less anxiety, less depression, and I guess this was in mice probably. I don't think it was in humans yet, but 
it's just amazing to think that even myself, my recommendations are probably going to shift over the next few years away from, maybe not away from herbs and things like that for stress, but that I could just recommend a probiotic instead. That's incredible to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. There's not clinical trials or anything like that happening yet, but it's just interesting to think that, um, like you said, this could be a therapy that could be useful in the future depending on what we learn. And it'll be much safer too than the than the standard prescription model now that doesn't seem to be helping people much at all. I mean, I've dealt with people where they get thrown three different things that the side effects of those make their anxiety or depression so bad when the target was to just fix something else. So it's kind of crazy to think that the gut hopefully will become the new thing that we're going to idolize as opposed to the brain. I think we've put so much focus into brain and what that does, but we've forgotten about the gut. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, I, I don't think these these new approaches will necessarily eliminate other approaches. There's obviously a lot of factors that influence these things, um, but it's going to be really interesting to have this kind of other perspective or this other tool that we can potentially use. Right. So what do you think people should take away from this? And maybe your your research in general or just the mindset that you've developed or, you know, kind of your your overall message to people. What do you think they should know or, or be doing? I think kind of the really general message is to, to try to start being aware that you have this microbial community living in and on your body. So you don't have microbes only in your gut, they're in your mouth, they're on your skin, they're everywhere, right? Um, we kind of know the most to some extent about the gut microbiota right now. Um, but to be aware that they're there, so be aware that what you're eating is affecting those microbes, which then can affect other things um, in your body, your immune system, your behavior, things like that. Um, we don't know enough for me to be able to tell you um, you should always eat kale and you should never eat steak. Um, but including a lot of fruits and vegetables and fiber in the diet appears to be a good thing. Um, antibiotic use. Antibiotics save lives. They're really important to use if necessary. Um, however, for a long time, uh, we were using antibiotics when we don't really need them. And antibiotics are not specific to a certain type of bacteria. Um, they will pretty much take out any bacteria they come into contact with. Um, so if you think about it, if you're taking an antibiotic for something that you don't really need it for, what you're doing is knocking out those other good microbes that you have um, in and on your body, uh, which can also cause health issues. Um, so really, I think my perspective on this is there's a lot we don't know, but there's connections there that we're starting to see, and we should start to think about how these different factors um, could potentially be affecting us, um, especially in, in regards to, to diet and um, antibiotic and other med medication use. Yeah, that's very helpful. And depending on who you ask, people say that we're approaching the end of the antibiotic era, which is pretty crazy to think about because it talks about how heart transplants and all of some of these really big deal surgeries, they wouldn't even be possible. They basically go away if we lose the potential to use antibiotics. So, Yeah, that's the other scary side of using antibiotics when you don't need them is you get bacteria that develop antibiotic resistance and right then your ability to use the antibiotic disappears um so there's a few good reasons to be careful when you're taking them yeah definitely and the hard part is people that say oh i'm fine i've never taken antibiotics in the past five or ten years but then if you're still not knowing the source or the antibiotic content of your food even you have the exposure there which is that's been shown just to have just as much or more effect on the on the bacteria. So I always encourage people just to get closer to the food source and try to ensure that you're not eating hormone and antibiotic meat and do your best because every step counts. And these little bacteria have seemed to be a lot smarter than we are. So uh, that's what I've learned at least. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um – you know, trying to be closer to your food source in general is probably a good approach just for maintaining a healthy gut microbial community independently of medications as well. Um, you know, this, my kind of perspective in terms of kind of recent human evolution, if you will, is that, you know, we've had these gut microbes for years and years and years and years across human evolution um, and relied upon them presumably to, to help, you know, buffer us from these diet changes across seasons, things like that. Um, I think I personally would probably be okay nutritionally 
without my gut microbes to some extent. Uh, the food I eat for the most part, pardon me, assuming that I'm eating a typical kind of Western diet that's high in fat, high in protein, easy to digest, um, you know, a lot of that's probably not making it to the large intestine, and I am probably not relying on my gut microbes for that energy so much. I don't go through periods of food limitation. Um, you know, in terms of the food that I eat, it's a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Um, but that doesn't mean that those gut microbes aren't there, and it doesn't mean that they're not reacting to my diet. And so it certainly doesn't mean that they're not affecting my health in other ways. So I think that's kind of a shift we've maybe seen. Um, in the human gut microbiota that, um, you know, our diet has shifted, that's changing the gut microbes and maybe affecting our health negatively um, in ways that it wouldn't necessarily be without those microbes. So the microbes started out as very important and they're still very important for certain parts of our health, but because our diet um, is so kind of uh, processed and easy to digest that maybe we're kind of wreaking havoc indirectly. Uh, oh, definitely. Through. Yeah. Definitely. Well, cool. Well, I want to send people back to your website if they want to read more. You got some cool pictures here and some of your research papers and stuff like that. There's quite a few um, science fanatics that listen to the show, and so they can do that. That's K-R Amato, A-M-A-T-O. Am I saying that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's K-R-A-M-A-T-O dot com, and they can see some cool pictures and things like that there. But is there anything else that you think people should know or that you'd like to say before we before we wrap this up? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, you know, it's just it's an exciting field, and you know, keep an eye on all the developments that that are happening in this area, because um, hopefully, like you said, there should be some interesting uh, medical developments in the future. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time. I'm glad we got to connect. That's the beauty of the internet. I just find a, a university paper or website or something, and I found found your niche and found you and got a hold of you. So it's quite a quite a cool experience. So thanks for coming on. Great. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. You too. All right. I hope you enjoyed that show. And if you haven't heard me talk about it yet, my second program, Stress Solutions, is coming up pretty soon. It's gotten a lot more complex in the explanation part of how stress affects the body and the mind and your cognition, things like that. But the takeaway section, the second half of the book, is, is going much smoother. So I just want you to keep an ear out for that and keep eyes out for that. I'm going to have four experts again, just like I did for Rim Rehab. So my good friend, Dr. Tim Gersmar, he's going to be one of the experts that's going to be on the show next week to talk about autoimmunity. But if you enjoy him, you're going to really enjoy his take on stress and how to manage the different types of stress inside of Stress Solutions, the program coming up here. You'll want to hop on my newsletter at notchespaleo.com. You'll see it right there at the homepage when you get there. You sign up for the newsletter. I'll send you two free guides, one about the top five things you need to do to help improve your life, removing toxins and how to do so, as well as a free food guide. And please visit my Facebook page too if you haven't. There's been a lot of cool input lately. And I appreciate you all helping me out with the new book cover design and the t-shirt designs I've been working with. There's a lot of cool feedback coming back from you guys. So I'd love for you to be part of the conversation over there at facebook.com slash notchespaleo. And then I'm doing a webinar here coming up pretty soon that you'll want to join. And this is just a free session to spend an hour with me. And I also do 15 minutes of question and answer at the end. To sign up for that webinar, visit I'm dot not just paleo dot com or you can just go to my website and you'll see paleo's paradise there you click on that link sign up for the webinar and you'll be tuned in it was a great time last week and a lot of good people came in there and got some really good advice so this is a good time just to connect with me one-on-one -on -one and learn more about my program so that's all i got take care take great care and i'll talk to you next week bye He acts like it's a good yeah, like everything's cool. Kiss a girl and I never please her. She doesn't have a clue that he's stare up and rules. Why I'm in a tire, got to watch out, girl. Don't want to see her by her eyes out, girl. Cause I've been watching, you've been hurting. Let me be the one that loves you better.